those are fit to live who do not fear to die. And none are fit to die who have shrunk from the joy of life and the duty of life. Both life and death are part of the same great adventure. Theodore Roosevelt. He was called T.R. and Teddy. By any name, Theodore Roosevelt was a true American original. At age 42, he was the youngest man ever to become president, and with his youthful vigor and vision, transformed America from a fledgling industrial nation into a world power. Theodore Roosevelt made the presidency the focus point of American government. He is generally perceived to be the creator of what is called the modern presidency. T.R. said no president ever enjoyed himself as much as I. And no wonder. His achievements include building the Panama Canal, creating national parks, and busting big business monopolies. He was the first president to go up in a plane and down in a submarine. And though he loved a good war, Theodore Roosevelt was the first American to win a Nobel Peace Prize. A whole lot of people see him as almost a human spirit incarnate. Enthusiasm personified, this tremendously alive person. Who could be bored with Theodore Roosevelt? New York City's loss would be the nation's gain when Roosevelt was appointed Assistant Secretary of the Navy by President William McKinley in 1897. As Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Roosevelt had relatively little actual power and relatively little influence, but he did work uh, hard behind the scenes to advance the cause of war. He did this partly because he thought that the United States should have an empire. He wanted war because he wanted to prove himself in battle. No triumph of peace is quite so great as the supreme triumph of war. T.R. got his war in 1898, when the Maine, an American armored cruiser, blew up off the coast of Havana during Cuba's revolt against Spain. The yellow press of the day leaped upon the sinking of the Maine as a uh, cause ballet. They blamed it on the Spaniards, and this led the United States into a war against Spain, which uh, John Hay, the good friend of uh, Theodore Roosevelt, called a splendid little war. Roosevelt, a leading advocate of intervention in Cuba, resigned from the Navy to form the first U.S. Volunteer Cavalry Regiment, better known as the Rough Riders. The rank and file were as fine natural fighting men as ever carried a rifle or rode a horse in any country. We had a number of first-class young fellows from the East, most of them from Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. But the great majority of the men were Southwesterners. They possessed hardihood, endurance, and physical prowess. And above all, they had the fighting edge. The Rough Riders were the genuine article. They really were. The chaplain of the Rough Riders said, well, a Rough Rider never killed a man except if he cheated at cards, and a man who cheats at cards deserves to be shot. That's what the chaplain said. On July 1st, 1898, Colonel Roosevelt and his Rough Riders became legends when they charged up San Juan Hill. The Battle of San Juan Hill, which actually involved assaulting two hills, Kettle and San Juan, was a very important battle in the capture of Santiago, Cuba, which was crucial in bringing about the end of the war in Cuba. And the Rough Riders were indeed heroes. They had the highest casualty rate of any regiment in the war, nearly 20% killed and wounded. So they were definitely in the thick of it. T.R. himself was wounded slightly on the arm by shrapnel. Roosevelt charged up the hill calling his troopers to come behind him the troopers were dismounted he was on a horse he shouted at uh, one of them why do you refuse to stand up when i am on horseback alone afterwards he invited people to look at those damned spanish dead he boasted that he himself had uh, doubled up 
a Spaniard. Unquestionably, he was a war lover, just as unquestionably he was a hero. T.R. would later describe San Juan as the great day of my life. The glory he had won had fixed his image in the public consciousness as a fearless, virile leader who would risk his life for a cause in which he passionately believed. Spanish-American War. Inley and Roosevelt won in a landslide, but any hopes the Republican Party bosses had of consigning T.R. to obscurity were dashed on September 14, 1901, when President McKinley was shot by an anarchist while attending the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York. McKinley died several days later, and Theodore Roosevelt, that damn cowboy, as Mark Hanna, McKinley's leading political advisor, had called him, was now president. At 42, Theodore Roosevelt became the 26th and youngest president of the United States. His youthful energy and outlook would transform the office. Unlike his predecessor since the Civil War, Theodore Roosevelt was an activist president. After the Civil War, most of the presidents had played second fiddle to Congress. Roosevelt decided to take over the government, and he became the leading figure in the nation. Theodore Roosevelt preached what he called the stewardship theory of the presidency. In other words, he was the steward of the people's interests or the manager on their behalf. And he believed, basically, that he could and should do anything that the needs of the majority required unless he was specifically forbidden to do so by law or by the Constitution. I did not usurp power, but I did greatly broaden the use of executive power. Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt's bold assertiveness extended beyond domestic concerns and into foreign affairs. T.R. believed in intervention, especially in the Western Hemisphere. He issued the Roosevelt Corollary, which is a forceful doctrine, which is still thought of as a major turning point in American foreign policy. And that is, any country that's so weak that they can't govern their own affairs, the United States is going to step in and run it for them. In other words, we'll be the policemen of the Western Hemisphere. The essence of T.R.'s foreign policy was expressed in a catchphrase. Speak softly and carry a big stick and you will go far. That was a West African proverb that he found and he made very popular. TR's big stick philosophy really meant speak softly, that is use diplomacy, and carry a big stick, that is be prepared, use deterrence, and it was really a combination of diplomacy and force. Roosevelt's big stick in most cases was the Navy. He sent it to the Caribbean to prevent the British, the French, and the Germans from encroaching on some of the island nations and to maintain order when various revolutions broke out. One revolution of special interest to Roosevelt broke out in Panama, a colony of Colombia in 1902. At stake for the United States was the construction of a canal. Part of T.R.'s overview of the world required that there be constructed across the isthmus of Central America a canal, one that would link the eastern coast of the United States with the western coast, this in the interest of American commerce. That was essential. He wanted the Panamanian Revolution to succeed because Panama would agree to a canal, whereas Colombia would not. So he sent battleships and supported a revolution without asking anyone. And that was really using executive foreign policy power, perhaps a little bit more vigorously than many people thought he should. I took the isthmus, started the canal, and then left Congress not to debate the canal, but to debate me. But while the debate goes on, the canal does too. And they are welcome to debate me as long as they wish, provided that we can go on with the canal. 
Theodore Roosevelt was the first United States president to leave the country while in office. He went to Panama to inspect the canal, to sit in a steam shovel and to throw dirt on his own. The Panama Canal was completed much quicker than most people thought possible, and believe it or not, under budget. It really was an organizational masterpiece and an engineering marvel. It was really the largest civil work ever undertaken by a modern uh, people. The construction of the canal began in 1904 and was completed 10 years later at a cost of $380 million. Though it opened for business after he left office, Theodore Roosevelt considered the Panama Canal the greatest achievement of his presidency. The canal was the major world history changing event of his presidency. The Panama Canal changed world trade patterns, changed world defensive patterns, changed how you could get from one ocean to another. But that was a huge, important contribution. And it wouldn't have happened if TR hadn't pushed it. Roosevelt's achievements in conservation are the Square Deal's most notable legacies. He has the right and duty of this generation to develop and use the natural resources of our land. But I do not recognize the right to waste them or to rob them by wasteful use the generations that come after us. Under Roosevelt, the number of national parks doubled. He designated 125 million acres as national forests and placed under federal control major reserves of natural resources. To accomplish all this, Roosevelt used his broad interpretation of presidential powers. The saving of Pelican Island in Florida was typical of T.R.'s style. Some bird lovers came to him and asked him to save that. It was federal land, it was a swamp, really. And he said to the officials, is there any law that will prevent me from declaring Pelican Island a federal bird preserve? And they said, no. There was no such thing as a federal bird preserve. And he said, therefore, I so declare it. And that was the first of 51 bird preserves. And that's the beginning of our Fish and Wildlife Service. In foreign affairs, Roosevelt maintained his policy of speaking softly and carrying a big stick. His diplomatic efforts to end the Russo-Japanese War in 1905 earned him the first Nobel Peace Prize ever won by an American. But T.R. was even prouder of the crews of the Great White Fleet. Roosevelt of the Great White Fleet had a number of objectives. In those days, it was considered perhaps impossible for the fleet to go around the world, so it had a technological aspect. Also, it was to impress the world that we were definitely a world power and could bring a military presence to bear anywhere in the world where we chose and when we chose. Another subset of the whole thing was that we were a Pacific power because of Hawaii and the Philippines, which were a U.S. possession at that time. So the fleet was meant to impress Japan with our, our military power and succeeded in doing so. In, 19, in 1908, Roosevelt fulfilled a campaign promise not to run for re-election. When William Howard Taft, his hand-picked successor, took office in 1909, T.R. took to the jungle. T.R. went to Africa right after his presidency ended in order to do uh, work for the Smithsonian to collect specimens for the museum, but also to hunt and to write about it. And he wrote about all of his adventures. He took his son, Kermit. And it was really a year of being out in the jungle and living in a tent and writing. And he loved it. There are no words that can tell the hidden spirit of the wilderness that can reveal its mystery, its melancholy, or its charm. There is a delight in the haughty life of the open in the long rides, rifle in hand, and the thrill of the fight with dangerous game. Returning home to a hero's welcome after his African safari, Theodore Roosevelt soon found himself the hunter and the hunted in the presidential race of 1912. 
While he was away, Taft disappointed him. He thought as Taft as a reformer in his mold, and Taft was very conservative. And Taft immediately changed things, particularly in the field of conservation. And Roosevelt was angered by this, and he fell out with Taft. Roosevelt challenged Taft for the Republican nomination. Though he won 75% of the primaries, the party regulars still threw their support to the incumbent. Undaunted, T.R. ran as a third party candidate, representing the newly formed National Progressive Party. It was the most progressive platform of any presidential candidate until probably Franklin Roosevelt's second term of 1936. It had votes for women, regulation of trusts, workman's compensation, it had a modified health program. It had everything the United States did not have at the time and did not really obtain until the New Deal. The Progressive Party was also called the Bull Moose Party, after a reporter asked Roosevelt how he felt. I feel as strong as a bull moose, T.R. declared. His campaign proved that most dramatically. On October 14, 1912, at the height of the Bull Moose campaign in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Theodore Roosevelt was shot by a would-be assassin. Roosevelt was standing up in a convertible, acknowledging the cheers of the crowd when he was shot. The bullet passed through his coat and through a glasses case, which was metal rimmed, and through a very thick folded speech, which slowed down the trajectory of the bullet. He was knocked down, he got up, coughed into his hand, no blood came up, so he figured he hadn't been hit in the lung. And so he went on to the hall and gave a speech for an hour and a half, then went to the hospital. He did it with a mixture of showmanship and bravery and calculation, characteristically his. I do not care a rap for being shot. It is a trade risk which every prominent public man ought to accept as a matter of course. Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt lost that election to Rudolf Wilson, but it's important to note that Roosevelt, with 27% of the popular vote, polled a higher percentage than any third party candidate in history has done. After the, elect after the election, Theodore Roosevelt, at age 55, went on the last great adventure of his life, an expedition to Brazil to find the source of an uncharted body of water the river of doubt. T.R. said it was his last chance to be a boy, and he was getting older, and he felt his age, but he still wanted to have this, this adventure with his son Kermit, his favorite traveling companion. His wife, Edith, was terribly worried that he would die on this trip, and he almost did. T.R. was injured, and he asked Kermit to leave him there to die because he felt he was holding up the party. And Kermit, of course, would risk his life for his father, so they kept T.R. in the party. They did find the source of the River of Doubt, and the Brazilians later named it the Rio Roosevelt. But the expedition had broken his health, and he was in poor health the rest of his life. When he came... Theodore Roosevelt spent his last days at Sagamore Hill. His strenuous life had taken its toll. He had already undergone operations to remove abscesses caused by jungle fever. He had lost the hearing in his left ear and had been blind in his left eye since 1908, the result of a boxing injury. The end came on January 6, 1919, when Theodore Roosevelt, at only 60 years of age, died of a blood clot in the heart. He was buried in Young's Memorial Cemetery on Oyster Bay, Long Island. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of good deeds could have done them better. That credit belongs to the man in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly who errs and comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, 
at least fails daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory or defeat. say about the war in Vietnam. Well, there's only one thing I can say about the war in Vietnam. In Vietnam, you're...